Welcome to our Sunday School Hour this morning. I wanted to invite you to take your Bible with me this morning, and we'll start by turning to Judges chapter 6. <coughs> Judges chapter number 6. Uh, we're continuing the series that we've been doing through the book of Judges. I've been excited about this series and uh, certainly have been enjoying teaching these lessons on this series called Frontiers for Faith. Uh, the people of Israel had come into this promised land and they had a lot of opportunity before them, but they had also a lot of uh, opposition and challenges as they were looking at this land where they had taken a certain amount of territory, but there still was much territory to be taken again. And so as they looked to God for strength, God had given them promises that if they would obey and follow him by faith, that they could push the boundaries of their influence through the nation uh, and through their region and really make a difference and bring the worship of the one true God to that land. And so also in a similar way in our land today, we also have an opportunity before us. We have a certain amount of influence in this country, uh, but like the children of Israel, it's not as great as it could be. And I want us to see how we can learn from these uh, heroes and uh, some of their victories and some of their defeats and see how we also can push back uh, the, the lies and the darkness spiritually in our nation, not fighting physical battles, but spiritual battles through prayer and through the ministry of the word. And so we're going to see here again this morning uh, what we started last week with Gideon and Gideon's story. We looked last week at the first part of Gideon's story. We saw Gideon's call in the first part of Judges chapter 6. We got all the way up to verse 24. And uh, today we're going to continue Gideon's story. And we're going to talk about uh, Gideon's conversion. Gideon's conversion. Now, we're not talking about getting saved. Like usually we use the word conversion. Or maybe somebody would say, uh, you know, that, what was your conversion experience? When did you trust Christ as Savior? But the word conversion means a change, right? Something being converted. And we're going to see how God did a preparatory work in Gideon's life to prepare him for another great work that he's more famous for later on. Uh, so we're going to start here we're in Judges chapter 6. And uh, we'll start by reading the first few verses here, uh, just verse 25 to 27. It says, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. And build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock, and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants, and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. All right, let's ask God's guidance. Heavenly Father, as we again open the story of Gideon and his situation, I pray that your spirit would really speak to our hearts to encourage us and to teach us what we can do in our land today uh, to make a difference for, for the truth and for you and for your work in this culture. Mm. Please help us today to make an impact. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. All right, so here we have Gideon, and Gideon's going through the situation. You remember from last week, if you're here, that uh, he had met with the angel of the Lord. We believe this was Jesus Christ had come pre-incarnate uh, mm -hmm. to speak to Gideon and had uh, given him a call and said, I want you to be the one who will defeat these Midianites who have been oppressing and stealing and impoverishing right. the children of Israel. They've been living in great poverty because of the Midianites. They cried out to the Lord for help, and God sent help. And he said Gideon was going to be the one. And so we saw how last week God had called Gideon and chosen Gideon for this great task. Though Gideon, in his humility, uh, said, I don't feel like I, I, I'm the guy for the job. I'm nobody special. I'm just an ordinary fella. Uh, I'm at least in my father's house, and, and my family is poor in the tribe of Manasseh. But, but God, if you want me, I, I'll, I'll do what you want. And so the same night it came to pass that God spoke to Gideon again. And he said, what I want you to do is uh, there's, a, there's an altar to Baal, uh, on your father's property uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I want you to destroy this altar uh, cut down the grove it was very common in these Old Testament times they would plant a grove of trees or they would come find a grove of trees and they would worship uh, false gods in these groves and the groves were considered sacred worship places he says I want you to cut down the grove of trees break down the altar and uh, and and offer a sacrifice to Jehovah in that place instead and consecrate the Lord and so the first thing we're going to see here in Gideon's situation is home changes. Uh, because in the changes that were going to take place in Gideon's life, the first thing that had to happen was to have some change in his own family situation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we want to think about changing our nation or changing our culture, changing society around us. But the truth of the matter is that in some ways that's impossible. 
not only because you know it's such a big influence around us but really because you can't change cultures without changing people it has to start on a much smaller scale if you're going to change something large it starts at home and that's where the things so often have to begin and so individuals and families have to be where change starts uh, you know what, uh, I like that quote from Leo Tolstoy, he said, everybody talks about changing society and nobody thinks of changing themselves. Uh, and that's the truth. We have to start much closer to home if we want to see a great change wrought in our nation. You know what, Gideon and all the people around him, they were crying out to God, Lord, save us from the Midianites. And God said, okay, I will, but first I have to save you from yourselves. And, and the truth of the matter is that so oftentimes as Christians, we look at society and our culture and the nation around us and we say, man, our nation needs help. It needs change. It needs an intervention from God. And we would, as Gideon and those people, want to cry out to God and say, God, help our land, change our people, change this country, change our culture to, to bring us back to gospel truth, to bring us back to the word of God that our nation was founded upon. But at the same time, maybe God would say to a lot of Christians in our land today, maybe he would say it to me, maybe he would say it to you, uh, I'm happy to change your culture, but uh, first I need to do some work on you. Amen. First I need to do some work, not in the government house, but in your house. Amen. And so that's where God starts with Gideon. Larger changes are inaccessible because our nation isn't made up of a nation. It's made up of families. It's made up of individuals. And so the work that God does in Gideon's nation starts in Gideon's own home situation. Now, as we look at this, his situation was this. His father's his father was the one who had this altar in the community. And his father seems to be a fairly influential person in the community because this was his father's altar. And that the people of the city would come and worship in this place. Mm -hmm. And so there's this altar of Baal. Uh, this false god, there was a grove that was built by the altar, or that was, had been planted and grown by the altar. Uh, and God tells Gideon, take this, this bullock of seven years old, this, the second bullock um, that your father has, uh, take it and use that animal to pull the altar down and cut down the grove and then all, offer this bullock as a burnt sacrifice to the Lord. And so Gideon takes this courageous stand for the Lord, uh, even though it was in the midst of his own family. Uh, th this was pretty courageous. Now you say, he doesn't look very courageous because in, you see in this passage, it says in verse 7 that he, because he feared his father's household and the men in the city, that he could not do it by day, he did it by night. <laughs> and he said, I don't know, if I do this, people are going to get really mad. And he was a bit fearful about the situation because his, his father's household obviously were worshiping at this altar. Mm -hmm. and, and the men of the city were obviously worshiping at this altar. These were, these were not strangers. This wasn't a, an unknown community. Uh, this wasn't even a big, you know, comparatively probably not a big town like Gravenhurst. Do uh, you know, remember what city, uh, if, without looking at your Bible, what city did Gideon live in? That's a tough one, isn't it? I don't know. Most Christians probably couldn't get that. It's not a big town. It's not like Jerusalem or, you know, one of these big famous places. It was Ophrah, Ophrah of the Abizarites. Now, I, I don't know anywhere else in the Bible that Ophrah shows up. It may, but it's not a big city. So this is probably a very small community, not a lot of people. And, uh, and so he probably knew all the people in his town. So this was a group of people that he knew them well. This was not going to be a, a, a secret. But he was willing to face up to the people closest to him, the people who knew him the best, and say, you know what? i got to obey God. I don't care what any of the rest of you are going to do. I'm going to obey God. And he made a choice to courageously stand for God, even to his own family. Sometimes it's hard to, hard to be blunt with our family, isn't it? <laughs> sometimes when the family's getting rowdy or the family's getting ungodly, sometimes it's hard to stand up and say, look, you guys do what you're going to do, but I'm not going to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. And that's an important stand that Gideon took in his own home. If he was going to stand for God in front of the nation, he needed to stand for God in front of his own home. Mm -hmm. And so even though he did it by night, he did it. Sure. He gathered together some helpers. We find in 20, verse 27 that he gathered 10 men of his servants. Uh, so again, we see this was an influential and affluent family. Mm -hmm. he, he, he says they were poor in Manasseh, but I don't know. If you've got 10 servants, you're not doing too bad. <laughs> <laughs> but he gathered together 10 of his servants. It doesn't say all 10 of his servants. Uh, 10 of his servants, so they probably had more than 10 servants in the household. Mm -hmm. And he got their help to gather together everything he needed, uh, chopping down a grove of trees by yourself at night. That's a big job. So he got some help. He enlisted some workers uh, that he had some influence over. And he took a stand for God and for truth. He said, look, if we're going to defeat the enemy around us, we have to defeat the enemy among us. 
And that was this altar of Baal. And so they cut down the trees. Uh, in verse number 27, it, it says he took those people. Verse 26, uh, he was told to build an altar to the Lord in this sacred place and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove that they'd cut down. So, I mean, everything was destroyed. This altar to Baal was being smashed to bits. Uh, the, the grove that they had worshipped in that had been a dedicated sacred place for worship, they were going to cut it down and burn it for the offering. And uh, I don't know why they had this, this seven-year-old bullock. Uh, it may have been part of their worship ceremonies or maybe it had been intended for an offering to Baal. Whatever the reason was, it also got burnt. <laughs> and so you know what it is? When, when there's something the devil's trying to do in your life, the best thing you can do is chop it up and burn it up. Okay? Uh, be thorough. Because you can't... You can't take those ashes and turn them back into a grove. Right. You can't take that altar that's been smashed and defiled, you know, not to us defiled, but to them it would be defiled. It'd be like, this was dedicated to Jehovah, we can't use it for Baal now, right. you know? And so he had made this place and this these things unusable for idolatry ever again. And so he had made a, a firm and defiant stand against what his own family was involved in. Mm -hmm. His father was a key man in this, remember. <laughs> I had heard this story growing up so many times about Gideon and how he smashed down the altar of Baal, and I was always like, oh, that's pretty cool. But it wasn't until later that I, you know, reading the Bible for myself, that I came to that phrase in verse 25, uh, in the end of the verse, the altar of Baal that thy father hath. And when, the first time I saw that, I was like, what? This was his dad's? Oh my goodness, that makes it a lot different story, doesn't it? It took courage to face up to the men in the city, but it took more courage, I think, even to face up to his own father and say, Dad, this is not right. We got to serve the Lord. So we've seen the home changes that Gideon starts with, and then we see also some name changes happen in this passage. Let's continue reading and see what happened next, starting with verse 28. It says, And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down. I think they were getting ready for their morning sacrifices. And what? <laughs> what happened? And, and the grove was cut down that was by it, and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, Who hath done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. Well, obviously, the ten <laughs> servants helped. I mean, there was enough witnesses. Word was going to get around. Verse 30, Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son, that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. <laughs> and Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning. If he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. Therefore, on that day, he called him, that is Gideon, Jerob Baal, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. I love this part of the story. Everybody wants Gideon's head, you know. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna get this guy, you know. They gather their torches and pitchforks, and and they're after Gideon first thing in the morning. And they arrive at Gideon's household, and they say to Joash, right, "He's got to die." And Joash so shows so, so a, a surprising change of heart. Uh, I don't know if it's because he loved his son more than he loved Baal, or because his son had had brought him to his senses to say, you know what. Uh, you're right, son, I should, I should follow Jehovah. I, Baal is nothing. I'm going to follow the Lord. But whatever the reason, I love Joash's response because he said, well, you guys are going to, you're going to stand up for Baal. Well, if he's a god, let him stand up for himself. <laughs> you know, yeah. Let Amen. Baal plead for himself. And so Gideon gets this new name, Jerob Baal. Now, sometimes you see people named with names that include Baal in them uh, in the Bible. For example, Mephibosheth was also known as Merib Baal. And so sometimes you see names that include that. And the word Baal was just a, a sort of like a uh, Canaanite or, or Hebrew word that meant Lord. And so it was like a, a name for these false gods. They called them Baal. And, uh, and so he calls them Jerob Baal, which means let Baal plead. He says, okay, if, if Baal is a god, let him deal with Gideon. Let him fight against Gideon. Let him deal with the situation. And of course, you know exactly what happened. Zero. Gideon didn't have to be scared of Baal. What could Baal do? Baal couldn't touch on his life. When Gideon received this opposition from the city, it's so exciting to me because so oftentimes when we receive and expect opposition for standing for God, sometimes we might get support from the, the places we least expect it. You wouldn't expect that the guy who owned the altar 
and had erected the altar and worshipped at the altar would be the first person to stick up for him. But he was. And so Gideon's own father showed some wisdom and clarity by standing up for truth and for his son and for the Lord. You know what? When somebody uh, makes a good decision and decides to make a decision for the Lord, they want to make changes in their life, they want to make some adjustments that they believe that God has led in their life, boy, we should be the first person to encourage them, shouldn't we? Amen. And I, sometimes we won't agree with what they're doing, and sometimes they might make a decision that we think, oh, I don't know if that's totally necessary. But you know what? If somebody's genuinely trying to serve the Lord, encourage them. Yeah. Uh, try and help them out, okay? Try and be a blessing to them. And that's what Joash did here. I don't know how much he agreed with what Gideon did, mm -hmm. but he saw that Gideon was doing right, and he was willing to encourage him in that. Mm -hmm. When you see somebody trying to serve the Lord, they might not get it right. They might make some mistakes along the way. But if somebody somebody's trying to serve the Lord, they're trying to grow in the Lord, mm -hmm. Give them some love, you know, give those right. people some encouragement. Amen. Let them know that you're standing behind them and you're standing alongside them. We don't need to fear evil. We need to stand with those who are doing right. Mm -hmm. I like it that Joash was willing to stand up with Gideon, yeah. even though it made him look bad. Because yeah. really, it's like, well, Joash, you were the one who built the altar in the first place. You know, you're the one who was worshiping. You're the one maybe who planted the grove. You're the one who was involved in all of this. And Joash was willing to say, you know what? I was wrong. We need to make some changes. Amen. Let Baal bleed. If he is really God, like I've been worshiping him to be, I like it that he was willing even though somebody else's good decisions made him look bad mm -hmm. to say, wow, I've been wrong. I'm willing to own up. That guy's doing the right thing. I'm thankful that he was willing to stand up for it. Now, we need not to fear evil. Uh, Joash says, well, if Baal is a god, then let him do something about it. But Gideon didn't need to fear Baal because there was no power in him. Right. You know what? If evil is so strong and if our culture is so wicked and so powerful, uh, if, if what's going on around us is so you know, omnipresent and omnipotent that it's almost like God, it's impossible to overcome our culture and the, the influence of society on the people around us. If it's so powerful, then let them overthrow God's work. Amen. Just stand up and do God's work and see what happens. Amen. If the, if the devil doesn't like it, you know what? He can sit on attack. Okay? Amen. <laughs> That's an old song. It's a nice old song. Uh, but you know what? If the devil doesn't like it, let him do something about it. I'm not Amen. scared. We can stand up for God. And you don't look at the culture like it's like it's a God, like it's right. omnipresent or like it's right. omnipotent or like it's omniscient. It knows everything and it sees everything. It, it has power over it. You know what? The devil's no stronger than, than the false god Baal. Yeah. He can do nothing right. but what a God allows. And so we need not fear that. We didn't need, don't need to fear evil. Because, you know what, if evil is so strong, let's see it stop a spirit-filled Christian. Amen. Let's see it stop the power of God. You Amen. can search all through the Bible, you can search all through history, you will not find it where God's people, standing in God's strength, were ever defeated by the devil right. or by the world around them. It doesn't happen. And right. you and I need not fear the culture because God has done a work in us. There's not a chance they can beat us. And I like here that we see Gideon getting a new name. Mm -hmm. A name that reflected that God had done a work in his life to bring him to this place where he was having victory over evil. Yeah. Uh, Jerob Baal. Uh, they still called him that a long time after that. That name stuck. His dad said, I'm going to call him Jerob Baal. Let Baal plead against this kid. He can stand up and do right. Mm -hmm. and, and that stuck with him. God had worked a change in Gideon's life to where people saw it on the outside and said, man, we got to give this guy a new name. Let's call him Jerob Baal. He's got victory over Baal. He's got victory over evil. And that name Amen. stuck. Reminds me of some other people, uh, like Saul of Tarsus. You remember, he got saved yeah. and he got a new name too. Right. <laughs> he got a new name. They called him Paul. He became an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and served the Lord faithfully for many years. Uh, impacted the world perhaps more than many other of, of Christians in history. Uh, how about a guy named, uh, uh, closely associated with Paul, uh, Barnabas? You know Barnabas yeah, wasn't his name. name. His name was Joseph. Uh, but they called him Barnabas, which means the son of consolation or the son of encouragement. Uh, because they said, man, this guy is not the same guy that he was born to be. You know, He was born into a family and he grew up in a Levit Levitical family. But he heard about Christ and he got so filled with the Spirit of God and so on board with the work of the ministry uh, that he's just Mr. Encouragement. And so they gave him a new name. But the Bible even talks about you and I as Christians that God will also give us a new name. Mm -hmm. In Revelation chapter number 2 and verse 17, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I think we're going to lose our slides here. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, 
and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. You know what? He says, he that overcomes, I will give him a new name, a secret name, a nickname, if you will, a pet name, uh, that only he and God will know. When we get to heaven, I think God's going to give each of his children their own special new name. Amen. You know, we've got a new name that God has given to us, just like Gideon got a new name, because something had happened in his life that was a permanent change in his direction. And so also God wants to work in our lives a powerful change because of our salvation uh, to work to direct us to a new way of life, reflected by our new name. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing I wanted to mention uh, is the heart changes that were also taking place in Gideon's life. Mm -hmm. The heart changes that were taking place. Let's look from verse 33 uh, down a few more verses and see something else that was happening here says that all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher, and unto Zebulun, and unto Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. So verse 33 would look like a bit of a discouragement, wouldn't it? In verse 33, all of a sudden, the enemies start gathering again. Mm -hmm. Seems like every time harvest time, show, time showed up, these guys showed up. Uh, they were always ready to, to intervene and to steal what was, what was gathered by the children of Israel. So the Midianites show up, the Amalekites, the children of the east, were all gathered together and pitched in the Valley of Jezreel. This is a central valley uh, in the nation of Israel. They weren't on the borders. They were right in the middle. They had come into this uh, north-central part of Israel and had camped out like the Bible talks about in, in, early in the chapter, uh, they and their cattle and their tents came as grasshoppers for multitude in verse 5. Uh, they were just like a swarm, like a plague, just sweeping into the country in multitudes, huge numbers of people, thousands upon thousands of people. And so it would look like a great discouragement when you hit verse 33, but I love how verse 34 starts. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Mm -hmm. You know what? The devil brought his his multitudes, and God said, "That's okay. I got one man with the spirit of God on him." Amen. That was all God needed, right there. He said, "I got one man with the spirit of God." That's what was needed. That's right. Gideon was being changed on the inside mm -hmm. by the power of God in his life. That's right. It says the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Mm -hmm. You know what? When you have the power of the spirit of God in your life. It doesn't matter if the, the multitudes are like grasshoppers swarming the countryside. You know what? God can work through one person. Amen. God can work mightily through each one of us. Mm -hmm. And I love how God had given promise to his people, one man of you shall chase a thousand. Amen. You know what? We also have the power of the Spirit of God in our lives. Mm -hmm. We can even have more access to the Spirit of God than Gideon had. Because you know what, it's very unique in the Old Testament finding people where it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon people like Gideon, people like Samson, uh, certain people in these Old Testament scriptures, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. Uh, but this was something where the Spirit of the Lord would come upon somebody for a special time and a special purpose. It wasn't on every person who loved the Lord, and it wasn't for every day of our life. <laughs> Sometimes you see people that the Spirit of the Lord would come upon them and then he would leave again. We see that in several instances in the Old Testament. And so it's very different in the Old Testament time from what we see in the New Testament in the Christian period of history. That we as God's children, when we trust Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit of God not only comes upon us, but comes in us. The Spirit of God indwells God's children, and he lives in us. And so that's the power of the Word of God that gives us that opportunity. I wanted, if we could, to turn to John chapter 14 before we come back to Judges. Uh, John chapter 14, we'll see there our relationship with the Spirit of God. John chapter 14, because Gideon received the power of the Spirit of God in his life, and you and I can receive the same spirit power uh, that Gideon had, but in a greater access way. So John 14, and you can look for verse number 12. Jesus is going to give his disciples some great encouragement here as he prepares to leave them. In verse 12, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. So we're talking about greater works. But how is that possible? We're going to see that in the verses ahead. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, 
And he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Who's that comforter? Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Amen. For I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, that's where I left off. Okay, good. Uh, so the Spirit of God is that one who not only, he said, he said to his disciples, he is with you, but he will be in you. And we do see that the day of Pentecost, don't we, where the Spirit of God in, came and indwelled these believers for that first time. Amen. And you and I, as God's children today, have that same Holy Spirit indwelling us as God's children. God's Spirit comes into our hearts and lives, and the power of God works in us in a mighty way. And we might look at Gideon and say, wow, you know, he had this amazing opportunity. He could, he could hear the voice of God. He saw the pre-incarnate Jesus. He had all these things. But you know what? We've got something better than that. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that Gideon didn't yeah. have. Uh, he had the Spirit of God come upon him, but you and I have the Spirit of God come in us. In John chapter 16 and verse 7, you can turn over a page or two. John 16 and verse 7, we find that Jesus encourages these believers again about this comfort of the Holy Spirit, that this was better for their ministry that they had the Holy Spirit than that they had the physical presence of Jesus. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth is, it is expedient for you that I go away. Boy, that sounds strange. It's better for you that I leave. Why? For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So God tells us that it is more helpful and powerful for our ministry lives, uh, for us to be able to do those greater works that he talks about in chapter 14 of John, uh, that we have the Holy Spirit indwell every believer worldwide than that we would have the physical presence of Jesus in one place at a time. Amen. You know what? The Holy Spirit of God is tremendous and powerful. And you and I as God's people, we have that inner transformation like Gideon was being worked on by the Spirit of God. We also have the Spirit of God working in our lives to transform us and to empower us for incredible opportunities in ministry. And so you and I, as we walk with God today, have an opportunity to see God do a work in us. Mm. And it's amazing that when, when Gideon got the power of the Spirit of God upon his life, the first reaction he had was he blew a trumpet. Now, that might not sound like something very exciting, but when he blew a trumpet, that was a symbol of we're rallying for battle. He blew a military trumpet in verse 34 of Judges 6, and he gathered the city of Ebenezer. Isn't that amazing? I mean, just a few verses ago, they were Baal worshippers. But Gideon's influence had convinced these people to rally around. I mean, look at this. I mean, verse number 34 Abiezer, the, the, the area, gathered around him. Mm-hmm. But that's verse 34. Mm-hmm. Do you remember in verse 30, they were looking for his head on a pike? <laughs> God did something that Gideon might have never expected. Mm-hmm. But somehow they realized this guy is somebody we should follow. Mm-hmm. He's got courage. He's got conviction. Mm-hmm. He's got the power of God. And you know what? We were trying to kill him, and we couldn't. Mm-hmm. Because his, his stand for God stood the test. And so these heart changes that were taking place in Gideon's life were starting to have an influence on the people around him. So he blows the trumpet. All of Abba Yezer gathers around him. Then he sent out messengers throughout all the tribe of Manasseh, who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto other tribes, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. So he's gathered uh, four tribes worth of soldiers together to fight against this multitude. Now that sounds pretty good. He's gathered together uh, thousands of soldiers, and he's ready to face out this battle. And so God's doing the work to prepare him uh, for this mighty work. And I wanted, before I leave this point, just to, just to, to mention this one other thought, and that is this, that the most important change for our society today is for God's people to be filled with the Spirit of God. Mm-hmm. That's what our society needs. More than more than politics, more than education, more than finances, more than uh, social reformation. Uh, we need God's people to be filled with the Spirit of God and, and yield to the Lord. You know what? Just because God's Spirit is indwelling you doesn't mean that He's in control of you. And so as we give ourselves to the Spirit of God, that's the most important change our nation needs. Is God's people to be filled with the Spirit of God, yielded to God in everything. All right, let's move on to the next changes. And those are what I've, what I've called miraculous changes because the next few verses we're going to see a couple of miracles. Let's pick up the story again in verse number 36. And Gideon said unto God, 
If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. Amen. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, this is an amazing situation where Gideon asked for some confirmation and encouragement mm -hmm. that God was really going to work the way that he had said. He said, Lord, I'm going to ask you to do something crazy and possible. Can you give me dew just on the fleece and nowhere around? Yeah. Well, that's miraculous. It doesn't work like that. Right. You study condensation and why dew happens. It doesn't work like that. Right. But he gets up in the morning, the ground is dry, and the 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 fleece isn't just moist with dew. Yeah. I mean, you know how dew is. You yeah. get up in the morning and everything's a little moist, a little a few drops of water here and there. Mm -hmm. He wrings a whole bowl full of water out of this fleece. I don't know how big right. a fleece it was, if it was a whole lamb's worth of fleece, but he wrings a whole bowl full of water out of it. That's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And it and then the next day, he says, well, that was pretty cool. But Lord, if, please don't get mad. But I really, if, if it's all right, could I have just one more? He said, could I have dry fleece and do on everything else? Yeah. And God's reaction was basically this, mm. no problem. Yeah. Mm. Amen. And it happened. He wakes up the next morning. The fleece that last night was soaked is completely dry. Mm. But everything else is soaking wet. Right. Now, this is really cool because... Here again, you see the, the genuine qualities of Gideon, the realness of this story. He's just an ordinary guy. He's not some super Christian who just, you know, I uh, got everything figured out and I just trust God 100% and all the time I'm okay and everything's fine. <laughs> he was still a little bit, you know, well, you know, I, I know God's called me and I'm trying to do right and, you know, I'm trying to follow God. But Lord, I just want to make sure that I'm not making a mistake here. <laughs> Lord, if you want me to do it, I'll do it. I just really want to be sure that it's you that's wanting me to do this. Not just my own idea, you know. He really wanted to be sh sure and certain. Now, uh, this is a very challenging passage because a lot of times people will do the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. they'll they'll put out a fleece for God. Maybe not a, a real fleece, but they'll they'll put out a thing and say, Lord, if this happens, I'll know that you want me to do certain things. Well, that's difficult because when we look at this passage of scripture, number one, uh, Gideon wasn't told by God to do that, and there's nowhere in the Bible that I know of that God tells us to ask God for guidance that way. Now, sometimes God will give you that, yeah. but we're not told necessarily to do that. So we don't have a lot of scriptural principles to say how to do that or when to do that or what to do or how to do it. But I will give you some principles uh, that will help us understand this. First of all, there's no guarantee that God will answer that. Yes, if you put out a fleece, there's no guarantee that God will answer that or uh, that, that whatever happens was necessarily an answer from God. So we need to be very careful about that. Uh, we don't need fleeces. We have the Bible. Sure. Gideon didn't have the Bible. Uh, very little of the scripture had been written at the time of Gideon. Right. And so we we don't need fleeces. Uh, we can find God's direction mostly in the Bible. Most of what you need to know about life and the decisions of life you're going to find in the Bible. Uh, there will be occasions where we need specific direction on some things, but there's no guarantees in the scripture that if you put out a fleece, God's going to give you an answer. Okay. The next thing I wanted to mention is that Gideon's situation was very specific in that, first of all, uh, Gideon already knew what God wanted. He wasn't trying to find out what was going to happen. He already knew. God had already told him very plainly what was going to happen. The second thing is that Gideon had already started the process. Mm -hmm. You notice he'd already gathered the army before he put the fleece out. Yeah. He was already committed. He said, Lord, I'm doing this because I believe you want, to, want me to do it. Mm -hmm. I just, would you give me some encouragement along the way? Yeah. And so we need to be very careful to follow the Lord. Uh, there's another example of God asking somebody for a sign in... Um, Isaiah chapter 7, uh, King Ahaz, God said to Ahaz, uh, ask thee a sign of the Lord, uh, thy God, ask thee either the depth or in the height above. Now, again, that's asking for a sign, but God had already told him what he was going to do. Yeah. So it wasn't to find out what God's plan was, it was just for confirmation's sake. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened with King Hezekiah, we don't have time to get into that as well, but, but when we look at putting out fleeces, we need to be careful to understand that we probably don't need them. Because in most situations, God's word is going to give us the answer of what we need to do and believe. But at the same time, we can be encouraged that, you know what, 
here's a guy who just genuinely wanted to serve the lord and god gave him some encouragement along the way ah he was struggling he was uncertain he was a little bit unsure about what was going on he said i think i'm doing what god wants me to do and i'm pretty sure that god's going to do what he said he's going to do but lord could you just give me some encouragement along the way and god does want our faith to be encouraged by ah his his activity in our lives and so we can look to god's actions in our lives as well and say you know god has been blessing god has been leading i have a revelation from the lord through the scripture and god has been giving me direction that's clear uh, I can step forward by faith, but Lord, it's like the like the Father. Jesus said, "I'll heal your son." And he said, "Do you believe?" And the, the Father said, "Lord, help! I believe. Help thou my unbelief." <laughs> Sometimes we come to the Lord that way. Lord, I believe you want this, and I believe you're going to help me. But Lord, I'm still a little nervous. Can you help me? And I think that's okay. You know, God didn't get mad at Gideon here, as far as we can tell. Uh, God didn't say, "Well, you should just have more faith. Just smarten up and you know, get get busy and, and stop asking questions." No, he did actually answer him, and he did encourage him along the way. And so if you and I are going to do a work for God to see our nation brought to the Lord and brought to the truth, uh, we need to understand that some of the changes need to happen closer to home. They need to be heart changes. Yeah. They need to be home changes. Yeah. And sometimes we need a little encouragement from God where God does some miraculous changes to encourage us along the way. But whatever God is doing, let us remember that we are those who have been changed, that our names have been changed, that God has given us a new start, a new direction, and that as we walk with God, that miracles are possible. And that if we will be filled with the Spirit of God and obedient to the will of God, we also can see a nation transformed, mm -hmm. as Gideon did. Amen. Let's pray as we close. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you again for the opportunity to open this portion of Scripture and to see what you did in the life of Gideon. I pray that our lives would be so transformed by your Spirit working in us that we would be that our Christianity might be unrecognizable from what it had been in the flesh in the past, but that your spirit would take control and do a work beyond our ability to explain. Help us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.